Order members, the sitting is resumed and it's now time for questions to the Minister of Social Development. And we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call David McElveen. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister for an update on the Affordable Warmth Pilot Scheme, please. I call the Minister for Social Development. Um, thank the member for, for the question. The Warm Home Scheme itself is our main fuel poverty scheme, and that's really targeted at privately owned and privately rented low-income households um, to improve just the energy efficiency of the homes and in that way tackle uh, the, the issue of fuel poverty. Um, the initial target was that we would uh, install energy efficient improvements in 9,000 homes, and we've been meeting the target continually year on year since 2009. Um, the Warm Homes Scheme uh, contract is due to end in, in June of next year, uh, so I've asked officials to review the scheme, um, to see how we're tackling fuel poverty, and taking into account the current research that uh, showed that over 33,000 households need to spend more than a quarter of their household income on heating their homes. So we recently completed an achievable, affordable warmth area-based pilot. That was done in partnership with OFM, DFM, with DARD. Um, with the University of Ulster, the Housing Executive, and 19 of the 26 local authorities. And that, uh, the, the aim of this particular approach was really to uh, deliver energy efficient improvements for homes in small concentrated areas of fuel poverty, to identify areas of poor housing and low income where you have that high prevalence. Um, the university evaluation of the pilot estimates that one in two of the houses contacted actually proved eligible for assistance from the Warm Homes Scheme. Um, a lot of this work was done in cooperation with Professor Christine Liddell from the University of Ulster, and it has directed us in that direction of area-based work, which seems to be much more productive in comparison with how things were being done uh, previously. Um, so from the initial positive results, we've now moved on to phase two uh, of the pilot, um, which is to test energy efficiency measures can be delivered using local installers to carry out the work. So this is encouraging. We're moving on to phase two, and um, it is a, a good way, I believe, of, of tackling fuel poverty. I call David McElveen for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I do thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the Minister will be aware that the Department of Health, through with, in partnership with the Public Health Agency, ran a scheme called um, Keep Warm Packs, which were very low-level, low-tech ways of, of, of tackling fuel poverty as well. I wonder would the Minister see the merit um, in his department considering some sort of a low-tech option um, to help those who are struggling uh, to, to heat their homes this winter? I am aware that in recent years that the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland have provided, as you say there, uh, some low-income households with keep warm packs, um, and they have been, as, as you indicate, they are very popular. I, I believe that the Public Health Agency have been able to identify some funding for around 2,500 to 3,000 keep warm packs for the scheme for this year. So it is a scheme that is very um, much appreciated and, and effective. And I, I certainly welcome that initiative. It is a good example of working in partnership uh, with others to tackle fuel poverty. And we recognise that fuel poverty is a priority. It is a key issue. It needs to be done in a cross-departmental way. Because if you look at the factors that create fuel poverty, they are factors that impact on the work of different departments. I call Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Uh, can I ask the Minister to confirm uh, when discussions involving the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, and the Finance Minister uh, on a welfare reform package of migrating measures for Northern Ireland concluded? This has been a major area of work for myself and for the Department over the past year. Um, there were very detailed and lengthy discussions and very intense discussions um, with those at Westminster, with DWP, and um, DFP had a, has an engagement also with the Treasury in that regard. But really, we got to the point there at the end of June where we would had the negotiation with Westminster, we have had the internal discussions with OFM and with DFM, with First Minister and Deputy First Minister, also discussions with the finance uh, 
Ministry as well, Finance Minister, and you are at a point now where we, we reached there at the, at the end of June, the point where we have put together, I believe, have got a package of measures that will result in, uh, if they were implemented, a much better situation for Northern Ireland than if we were simply to take welfare reform as it is in GB. It addresses the worst aspects of welfare reform while containing the elements of it that are positive. But that work has now concluded and did conclude at the end of June. Uh, and I call Jimmy Spratt for a supplementary and could I urge him to try and steer away from the oral question that is listed uh, for later. Mr Spratt. Well, I will do my best, uh, Deputy Speaker, to uh, not incur your wrath. Uh, uh, but I hope... Uh, uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for the answer that he has given? And uh, does the Minister not agree that there is an urgent need uh, to share with the people of Northern Ireland the details uh, of the package uh, which would clearly demonstrate devolution, delivering real and tangible differences uh, to people's lives here within the province, uh, uh, and, and something that has concerned people uh, uh, for quite some period of time. Um, thank you um, for, for the supplementary. I think that the, the point is very well made. By June, we had a position where we have a, a good package of measures and interventions um, to make welfare reform much more suited to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. The question now is that there are many people out there who are asking, well, what is this? And in fact, um, I met the other week with um, the, the chair and chief executive from Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, which is the, the, the voice and representative body for the community and voluntary sector in Northern Ireland. And they were keen that we get that information out there uh, into the public domain because there is uncertainty, and that's not good. Um, there are concerns which may well be allayed if people knew what the, the, the package was. Um, and there's also confusion out there because um, as changes are implemented in Great Britain, because of the nature of the uh, technical side of, of delivering welfare benefits, uh, information will come out to people here in Northern Ireland which uh, only applies to GB. We will then have to write out to them and say, by the way, you received such and such a piece of information. That does not apply to you. And so you're actually creating confusion by the delay. And so for, for uh, all those reasons, uh, I think it's important that we get that um, information out as quickly as possible, allaying fears, um, providing assurance for people and avoiding confusion. I call John McAllister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, continuing on on welfare reform, and I will bear the Deputy Speaker's advice in mind. Uh, the Minister's colleague, M Minister Hamilton, yesterday stated that the cost to the Treasury um, in a letter would, would, was currently running at five to six million per month, and then that could, um, by not legislating, that could quickly go to 50 to 60 million by not legislating for this by January. Is the Minister uh, in a position to say actually when he's going to bring the bill back to the House? Um, I've indicated, um, Mr Speaker, there in response to, to that question, that I think it would be good for the general public to be aware of the contents of, of the particular package for Northern Ireland uh, for a whole range of reasons. That's an additional reason. Um, the, um, Information that was passed on by the uh, Finance Minister is information that's been in the public domain for some time. Um, the Prime Minister has spoken about it. The Secretary of State has spoken about it. Other Westminster uh, ministers um, from DWP have spoken about this and from the Treasury. So there is a concern there that over a period of time you get into a difficult position there in terms of potential penalties. But this is not a matter that is just for me. This is a matter for the entire executive. And therefore, I believe it is right and proper that as soon as possible we get this into the executive and get it out in there, into the public domain and into the assembly for further discussion. Um, but it's something that is a matter for the entire executive, and particularly OFM, DFM, as well as myself. I call John McAllister for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. But given that this is now only about three months until January 2014, we do not... I think it's important that the confusion ends as, uh, out there, as the Minister outlined in his earlier answer, and is absolutely imperative. Does he agree with me that it is time his executive colleagues um, 
with him pressing on this, they'd actually uh, grabbed the bull by the horns and made a decision on this before uh, we simply run out of money. Um, I have in the past commented on the potential difficulty in terms of penalties. Um, I was in this chamber accused of scaremongering by a member of another party. Um, I think the, the point was made yesterday this wasn't scaremongering. This is a real potential difficulty that is coming down the track. But apart from the penalty issue, there are all those practical, sensible reasons for moving forward on this, and they are the ones I have already outlined. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as the question I'll be asking relates to an announcement yesterday, if it does appear later on the agenda, there's clearly been a bit of insider trading. Uh, can I ask the Minister for his reaction to the announcement by the Finance Minister yesterday of £5 million uh, for co ownership housing? Um, yes, indeed, I do. I, I welcome the additional £5 million for, for co ownership housing. I bid for £10 million, but uh, in the spirit of generosity, I did get £5 million out of the, the, the Finance Minister, uh, and I welcome that. Um, there is uh, a real benefit from co ownership housing. It has been extremely successful in the past, and I think it is a welcome uh, investment in that particular way of bringing more people into home ownership, providing affordable housing, and also it is of great benefit, I think, for the construction sector. Um, it has been in the recent past and will continue to be important for them. I call Peter Weir for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his response. Um, I suppose to get a bit of a snapshot of where we are in terms of the co-ownership situation, can I ask the Minister how many co-ownership um, homes have been provided since the Minister came into office? Um, in the first year, 2011-2012, um, it was a figure of just over 500 um, homes were purchased through co-ownership. Um, in the second year, 2012-2013, um, um, it was around 950 homes were, were uh, purchased through co-ownership. I'm glad to say this year we're actually well ahead of our target. Um, the target was 500 homes in 2013-14, and we're in line with those expectations. Already we've delivered beyond that 500 by providing 540 uh, homes delivered, and there's approximately 650 more are in the process uh, of applications being dealt with at the moment, so well on target, in fact well beyond it. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. And in light of this morning's news that the construction sector appears to be taking the, the first steps out of a period of recession which basically brought it to its knees, can I ask the Minister what efforts his department has made to maximise opportunities with that sector? Um, as the member does, I too welcome the news this morning uh, in relation to the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors um, survey, which said that the, the construction sector is exiting, in fact has exited, uh, recession. So that's a, a good piece of news. Uh, a rise in workloads has been reported for the first time in five years. Uh, and just to, to, to address what, what, from my own perspective, DSD has been doing in that regard, we have talked there already about co-ownership, but we provided over £228 million in 11, 12 and 12, 13, and that resulted in the building of 2,800 social homes and also uh, provided over uh, 80, £83 million this year with a target to start 1,275 social homes. But the social building aspect of the department's work is only part of the picture. You also need to look there in terms of uh, the construction sector gaining through um, public realm schemes and neighbourhood renewal work. And over the past couple of years, around £50 million each year has gone into uh, physical development schemes and about £50 million as well and a little bit more into neighbourhood renewal schemes. So all of those, whether it be the social housing sector, the co-ownership, the um, physical work, public realm work and so on, neighbourhood renewal, all these have certainly been of great help to the um, construction sector and have contributed to some degree in that good news this morning that they have exited recession. And that ends our period of topical questions and we move on now to oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Adrian McQuillan.
Question two, Deputy Speaker. The regeneration of Portrush Harbour is a priority for me, as I believe that the development of the harbour will help to promote Portrush as a premier international destination. The extension and development of Portrush Harbour was one of the proposals originally contained in the Portrush Western Peninsula Strategy, which was published by Coleraine Borough Council. A subsequent feasibility study carried out by the Council showed that it was possible to extend the harbour and thereby create a new commercial marine facility. My officials have established a new programme board to oversee the strategic implementation of the regeneration initiatives in the Portrush strategy. The first meeting of that programme board, which is made up of senior representatives from DSD, DOE, Northern Ireland Environment Agency, DRD, the Tourist Board, Strategic Investment Board and Coleraine Borough Council. That will be held on the 30th of October, just in a matter of days. Uh, following this meeting, the Department will take the lead to carry out an environmental impact assessment and an economic appraisal to develop and identify how best to take uh, the development of the harbour. With any major development, it is important that we learn from previous studies so as to create a facility that is commercially viable, helps to improve economic development and offers a wide range of community uses. The project will help to build on my department's investment of £2.3 million in the public realm on the East Strand uh, Promenade and Station Square and the installation of free Wi-Fi within the town centre in Portrush and for the beaches there. I call Adrian McQuillan for supplementary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Uh, will the Minister ensure that the economic potential of the harbour in Port Royce is maximised and at the same time keep open and available to the public while this work is going on? Um, one of the key things there uh, was the, the, the point I made in, in the initial answer about learning from how these schemes were done previously. And um, there are um, lessons to be learned from how some other harbour developments were taken for, and I certainly think those will be learned um, and applied in the case of Portrush. Uh, we want to make sure that you get the economic benefit, but you also get the wider community benefit and community access uh, to the harbour, which is such an important part of the um, tourist experience for people going to um, Portrush. I should have advised members that questions number 1, 10 and 14 have been withdrawn. We now move on to question uh, uh, from Leslie Cree. Number 3, Deputy Speaker. I previously announced in the Assembly that I had agreed with Lord Freud, the Minister for Welfare Reform. Um, a number of operational flexibilities for Northern Ireland in the payment arrangements for universal credit. Those flexibilities will allow for more frequent payments, direct payments to landlords, and also for split payments. My officials have consulted with a wide range of groups in Northern Ireland through open public forums and an oversight group established under the chairmanship of the Permanent Secretary. And there were also discussions with the Executive Subcommittee on Welfare Reform and the Social Development Committee itself. In recent months, the draft criteria have been finalised and they now form part of a package of measures which I have negotiated with London and have also been discussed with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Minister of Finance. I believe this package would enable us to implement welfare reform in a way that will meet the needs of the people of Northern Ireland and produce the best possible outcome. Uh, I have to say I am frustrated by the lack of progress and that's a frustration which I've said already has been expressed to me by the Chief Executive of NICVA at our recent meeting. I do believe it's time that we discuss and agree the proposed package, not only to avoid the potential financial penalties that I've already mentioned, which could be imposed by Her Majesty's Treasury, but more importantly, that we start to tackle the real issues of helping people back into work. And that's the aspect of welfare reform in terms of universal credit, where you remove the current disincentive sometimes for people to get back into work by removing uh, those blockages through the introduction of universal credit, we can encourage people back and support people back into work on the basis that if you do more work, you do any work, you are always better off than if you weren't. I call Leslie Cree for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that. Minister, it's exactly 12 months to the day that you made a statement on the flexibilities for universal credit. 
At that time, you also committed to a programme of consultation on the criteria for the flexibilities. Uh, like most things, uh, little detail actually has emerged. Minister, can you give a commitment that the issues raised by the group which explored the issue in the beginning will not only be listened to, but will be accurately reflected in the next version of the bill and subsequent regulations? Well, I can assure the, the uh, member that the consultation with a wide range of interest groups representing different sectors of society, um, different family structures, people with disabilities, all sorts of possible uh, interest groups there that have engaged fully in this process, that those have been taken very much on board. Now, people will have aspirations and, and wish lists and some of those things may not be possible, but I think that when you look at what has been suggested and what we're bringing forward in due course, that you will see that we've really paid close attention to, to the input that we've received. I attended a number of the um, consultation meetings personally, um, some of them in, the, in this very building in the Long Gallery, where um, different aspects of the, the flexibilities were looked at, because you've always got to bear in mind with these things. There's a flexibility and there's advantages from having it but there may well be an associated cost, and it's finding the right balance uh, between the cost and the benefit to make sure, as I say, we get the right deal for Northern Ireland. But I think we're there, uh, and that we've got a very good arrangement in place uh, to bring forward in due course. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you spoke in broader terms about uh, welfare reform. I wonder, has your department conducted any analysis of the loss of income uh, to the people and families in the north most affected by uh, the welfare reform ch uh, changes which are being uh, brought in by the Tory government? Well, the answer to that, of course, is yes. We have looked very carefully uh, at the implications of welfare reform. And there are good parts in welfare reform and there are parts that are not so good. And alongside that, you have the Treasury's attempt to uh, limit the increase in expenditure uh, on, on welfare um, benefits over the next number of years. Um, there are winners and losers in these things. That quite often is the case. Um, but I, I would just pick up on one point, and that is that some of the figures that have been quoted um, in the media about the cost to Northern Ireland have been unrealistic. Um, one recent report uh, quoted a figure of so many million pounds per year, but when you actually drilled down into the figures, um, th there was some confusion because they were mixing up figures for Northern Ireland with figures from GB. Um, the number of people who will be affected by the, the, the benefit cap in Northern Ireland would be uh, modest, think 620 households, but the impact per household is a lot less than it would be in GB, where you have some areas with huge amounts going in housing benefit. There were also aspects of, of some of the reports where the positive side of welfare reform wasn't taken into account, and also some of the changes that go back a number of years, in fact, go back to the Labour government, and changes that were implemented um, when your own party was in charge of uh, DSD. Some of those things were actually counted in. They're actually things that have already been uh, in place for some time. So we need to be careful. We, we, we make people aware of the, the issues and get accurate information as far as possible and not create situations where people have unnecessary fears. There are concerns. We all share them. But we should not, I think, um, exaggerate uh, and create unnecessary fears. I call Sammy Douglas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if claimants will have to apply for the flexible payment range arrangements under universal credit? Um, my my de department will automatically consider a flexible payment if um, available information indicates it would be appropriate. Um, for example, if a claimant is known to have severe or multiple debts, then that's the sort of information that needs to be taken into account. Um, claimants will also be able to request a flexible payment at any time. Um, and a referral, referral for a flexible payment can also be made by a third party. Um, any claimants wishing to opt out of direct payments to a landlord will have to request this. And an opt out will not be allowed if the department considers the claimant to be at risk of accruing arrears of debt. There are people who are, who are vulnerable. We need to be sure that we have a system that takes account of that and does not expose them to unnecessary risks. 
And that's the sort of thing that I think, in terms of making it better in Northern Ireland, uh, is so important. We're focused on that. And what's also significant I mean, is that people in Great Britain are now looking at some of the things we're talking about here and saying, actually, maybe that is the right direction of travel. Moving on, I call Ian Milne. Guest of Rakhar, question four. I remain supportive of introducing a system of developer contributions for affordable housing. Indeed, it is a key action in my housing strategy for Northern Ireland entitled Facing the Future. I have been critically evaluating this issue over the past few months, and two key factors will impact on the timing of the introduction. The first is that appropriate processes need to be in place to manage any regime efficiently. And secondly, that the timing is crucial in light of the challenges facing the construction sector currently. In the present market conditions, and we've commented already on the fact that the construction sector is or has exited recession, but it's still not in the strong position that it might have been previously. It's likely, therefore, in the present market conditions to prove extremely difficult to realise contributions. My officials, in conjunction with officials from the Department of the Environment, will reassess the matter shortly to examine whether the housing construction market has had the opportunity to improve sufficiently to allow developer contributions to be introduced. I also continue to impress upon the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the Housing Associations the need to deliver the requirements of the Social Housing Development Programme and maximise the opportunity for social housing within the budgets available. And that was one of the key points that I stressed in the speech to the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations. I call Ian Milne. Gurma, good day, Alas and I would like to thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, I hear everything that the Minister has said, and he has partially answered uh, the question that I had from a supplementary. But um, I would ask, when would he expect that the social houses to begin through developers' contributions? When, do, when would you imagine that that might be, or when that might be? Thank you. Yeah, um, as I have indicated there, officials, in conjunction with DOA officials, um, are about to reassess the whole situation and just see what, what potential there is. Um, it would be wrong for me to prejudge that piece of work before it's even started. But um, it is something that we feel strongly about. We remain very supportive of it. And therefore, I look forward to receiving that report from the officials uh, from DSD and DOE um, in due course. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? Can I ask the Minister what action has been taken to maximise the opportunity of social housing within the budget available? Um, I and my officials have met on a number of occasions with the chief executives of housing associations to discuss possible new initiatives that could be introduced to maximise the delivery of social housing. Um, this year, incentives have been introduced to encourage housing associations to undertake advanced land purchases to support the social housing development programme in forthcoming years. Um, I would like to see us in a better place with the housing associations in that they do need to be more ambitious, more creative and more innovative in the way that they do their business. And last week at the um, annual conference of the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations, that point was stressed very strongly in the contribution that I made uh, to them. And it was also picked up, I think, by um, the, the, the leadership within the Federation. I think they realise and they agree very much with us. In fact, they've said that clearly. They think that uh, it's a sector that um, needs the opportunity to be innovative and creative. We've been trying to learn from housing associations in Great Britain because I think they have in the past been innovative and creative. And I could also say here that we have some very good housing associations, but we just need to get more done and delivered on the ground. Uh, we're looking at issues that they have identified, some work around regulations that uh, might make it easier for them. And we're also looking at what are the obstacles to delivering more social housing actually on the ground? Are there issues around planning, whatever it is that's possibly holding up, are there things that could be done differently by government? That's very much on the agenda at the moment because we do need and we want to deliver more. I call Alex Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Picking up on, on your last point, Minister, and given the success, as I would describe it, 
of uh, new build housing starts in, in the time of your predecessors. And given that there are less new build starts in your time, um, and noting what you said about why that might or might not be the case, where you and I might agree or not agree, could you indicate, given the target of 13, 14 new build starts in the housing association sector, whether that target is going to be reached or whether, as has happened in the last couple of years, once again, it is going to fail? In terms of the targets set out in the programme for government, we set out a figure there for social and affordable homes, and we will reach that target. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, question five. I have been advised by the Housing Executive that the information is not available in the format requested by the member, as the Housing Executive does not routinely collate information by parliamentary constituency. Um, I might say that is an issue that I have been looking at recently because um, information is more understandable and I think can be interrogated more easily by um, members of the Assembly if it is available on a constituency basis rather than on the basis of housing executive offices. However, the housing executive's local office areas of Antrim, Newton Abbey 1 and Newton Abbey 2, at least part of Newton Abbey 1 and part of Newton Abbey 2, um, cover the South Antrim area. Parts of Newton Abbey 1 and 2 are also in North Belfast. And at the 11th of October 2013, there were a total of 132 properties that had been vacant in those office areas for more than eight weeks across the three. Of those properties, only 39 were available to let, which equates to 0.6 per cent of the total housing executive housing stock in the three areas. The remaining properties were vacant for reasons such as decanting, undergoing repairs and pending sale or demolition. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for his answer? very comprehensive answer and I'm sure he's like myself he would be distraught at the fact that there's over a hundred houses not in circulation currently but can the minister say tell us what the, uh, the what he's doing in relation to those houses or to try and turn around these houses in a much quicker manner the issue of empty homes um, is an important one because it's a way of uh, when you address the issue of empty homes quite often you remove a blight on a particular community, sometimes a cause of antisocial behaviour or a magnet for antisocial behaviour. And secondly, you're also bringing a home back into use. So there's a, a, a double win there. Empty homes are a wasted resource. Uh, and as I say, they can attract crime, antisocial behaviour. I'm determined to deal with the problem. It's one that I think did not receive enough attention under some previous ministers. And uh, I've outlined my approach in the Empty Home Strategy and Action Plan which was issued on the 6th of September 2013. The reason the houses are left empty are complex. It can range from the individual who for some reason is unable or unwilling to do anything to bring the house back into use. And there are some landlords who have properties that they have no longer the resources to bring back into use. To houses being situated in areas where people don't want to live. And therefore a variety of approaches need to be developed if such empty properties are indeed to be brought back into use. Um, the Department is working with the Housing Executive to ensure that the Empty Home Strategy and Action Plan is implemented. And there are a range of actions set out there in that strategy and action plan, which I believe being taken forward in that collaborative way can really make a, a difference. There's a role there for the Housing Executive, there's a role for housing associations, there's a role for local authorities. And if we get together and address this properly, I think we can really make a difference. Uh, I think that um, particularly housing associations can play a significant role in facing up to that challenge and tackling that challenge of bringing empty homes back into use. Um, it's a, uh, a gain for everyone, both in that sense of removing blight and also providing additional accommodation. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm just wondering, could the Minister uh, advise the House, uh, the house on uh, the empty uh, houses that were made vacant by the army and, in, and around uh, Lisburn Lambeg direction. Um, the member is referring to a very particular scheme, and he didn't actually name the scheme because I think that there are um, possibly a number of uh, areas in Northern Ireland, where, and particularly in that area, where there are housing uh, properties that could be brought into social housing previously belonged to the army. Um, the, I have had representations on some of these from uh, local elected representatives in, in uh, that area. Um, and 
I'm encouraged the way the work is ongoing. Um, it's an opportunity to provide homes, but um, we shouldn't just simply think in terms of homes in those areas necessarily being social housing. Uh, the Members' Party is very committed to the idea of shared housing. Uh, I welcome the endorsement of the member to that point. And that's not just shared in terms of religious or political background. It can also be shared and mixed in terms of tenure. Uh, so how we, we take those forward, um, we need to look at the, the, are those houses, do they match up with, for example, the need in that area? Uh, the member may have studied, I couldn't quote off the top of my head, but I'm happy to look at uh, the, the, the particular need there in terms of the, the waiting list. Is it for three bed, four bed, two bed, single bed? Is it for what particular type of need is there in that area? You need to match up the, the housing with the need and then you can decide on the best way forward. It doesn't matter if we take it forward by the housing executive and the housing associations. Moving on, I call Pam Brown. Question number six, please. At the 31st of March 2013, there were 91 applicants in housing stress in Ballyduff. Based on last year's allocations, it's estimated that 41 of these will be accommodated by allocation of existing properties. The housing need of projection for the period 2012 to 17 is 25 units, and a scheme for 30 units by Oakley Housing Association is included in the current year of the Social Housing Development Programme on the site of the former Ballyduff Primary School. At the 31st of March 2013, there were 79 applicants in housing stress in New Mossley. Based on last year's allocations, it is estimated that 35 of these will be accommodated by allocation of existing properties. The housing need projection for the period 12 to 17 is therefore 45 units, and a scheme for approximately uh, 20 units by Conswater Housing Association is included in the current year 2013-14 of the Social Housing Development Programme at Milewater Drive. I might add that the next Social Housing Development Programme, um, I've been told by the Housing Executive, should be um, through by November and on my desk by December, uh, which is good because uh, in past years it has been much later, in fact too late in coming. This year they are on target in terms of, of having the information through, and I must commend the housing executive, senior staff, and uh, the, the chairman in that regard. Um, and I look forward to seeing that. Uh, members, there is some interference from mobile phones, so I'd ask members to check that their uh, equipment is not interfering with the broadcast. And I would call Pam Brown for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. It's clear that the, the need's not being met in um, Ballyduff and New Mossy. I would ask the Minister to tell us what will be done to address the need. The Housing Executive has indicated a need for 420 new homes across both Newton Abbey 1 and Newton Abbey 2 districts. And as I indicated earlier on, Newton Abbey 1 and Newton Abbey 2 districts are split between South Antrim and uh, North Belfast as well, which makes some of the calculations a little bit more difficult. But I've had concerns for some time now that sufficient new social housing is not being programmed in all areas across the borough. And that includes, I think, both the uh, South Antrim section and also the, the North Belfast section. And I've met with the housing executive in recent weeks to express those concerns. The housing executive tell me there's a shortage of sites in the area and that housing associations are having difficulty in identifying suitable locations for development. This is clearly not solving the problem. I've asked the housing executive, therefore, to bring forward an initiative to tackle the issue, to including looking at land in their own ownership and land in adjacent areas, which might be suitable for dealing with Newton Abbey need. This is a work in progress, but I expect more schemes to be programmed in the new social housing development programme for 2014-15 to 2016-17. And as I've indicated, that's currently under construction and will come to be for approval in December. I call Sydney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Question seven. Thank the member for, for his question. And I've been looking at this issue for some time now since I became aware that there were some 5,000 housing executive properties across Northern Ireland that were of no fines construction 
That is, they are constructed from a type of single skin concrete wall with no cavity and therefore no possible cavity wall insulation. And they tend to be cold homes and in some cases uh, not only are they thermally inefficient, but depending on the exact nature of the construction, there can be issues around dampness uh, and condensation as well. It's an issue that's been around a very long time, for many years. Um, it hasn't been dealt with in the past. It has been ignored uh, in previous years and under previous regimes. Uh, I'm glad to say that the um, current chair and uh, vice chair of the housing executive and the chief executive uh, recognise very much the, the need for this issue to be addressed. Um, it's important that we keep building new homes, but it's also important that we keep the housing executive stock up to standard. So um, I believe that those properties would benefit from a programme of external insulation. And I've asked the housing executive to urgently develop such a programme for all houses of no fines construction, prioritising those properties most in need. The Housing Executive has now set up a working group to progress their strategic approach to thermal performance of all housing executive no fine stock. And the group will initially consider the technical solutions available. Once options and costs are made available, the Housing Executive will evaluate the strategic direction regarding these properties. I call Sidney Anderson for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his response. Minister, you have touched on some of the actions being taken, but uh, can I ask that this be treated as a matter of urgency? Uh, we have to bear in mind that there are a number of uh, these properties, you say 5,000, some in my own constituency in Upper Ban. And, uh, I would ask that priority be given to, to, to uh, address this issue because a number of these homes are, are, uh, have senior citizens uh, living in them and it is costing a lot of money to uh, to, to heat their homes, and I think it's something as the you The member has yourself. asked this question. It's not an opportunity for a statement. Thank you. Okay. Thank the member for, for his question there. Um, earlier this year, the House Executive completed a pilot scheme on two rural cottages at Bog Road, Corain, to install external insulation. And this will be evaluated, therefore, over the winter and spring period. The House Executive has also initiated two other pilot schemes at Silverstream in Belfast and Spring Farm in Antrim to consider the impact of external insulation for no fines properties. The evaluation and outcome of those schemes will inform the housing executive's strategy for addressing thermal performance in the rest of its no fines and rural cottages stock right across Northern Ireland. And I'm pleased to say that the housing executive was approached by the building research establishment who are facilitating the latest round of the Technology Strategy Board Research and Development funding titled Scaling Up Retrofit of the Nation's Homes. And what they're doing is trying to ascertain the housing executive's willingness to participate as a partner. They consider that the housing executive's mix of stock and technical challenges would give the proposal a really unique selling proposition. So Northern Ireland, in practice, will become uh, an opportunity to pilot some of the most innovative ways and the best ways of addressing a problem that was ignored uh, for far too many years. And as the member says, people in those homes, many of them older folk, um, were allowed to remain in those conditions without being addressed. We're determined to address it. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his response to date. And would the, the Minister also be reflective of it's not just housing executive homes that need insulation because of heat loss? And I am aware the Minister visited some homes in the Fountain recently, and I would ask the Minister would he give careful consideration to a modernisation programme to the owners of private homes in that, in that area? There, there, there is a wider issue around regenerating some of those inner city areas, such as um, the Fountain around Wapping Lane there and the little streets of it. Um, and, and, and I welcome the members' um, interest in that, because having gone up there, I mean, you think that this is the United Kingdom City of Culture Year for, for Londonderry. And I think it's a disappointment that we're come to the end of that year and that particular part of the city uh, remains as it is and it has been addressed. But I, I share the member's position on that. This is a widespread problem, particularly the, the no fines issue. It occurs not just in uh, the case of housing executive properties, not so much housing association because they tend to be your stock. This is a problem going back to the 1960s. 1950s, 60s, early 70s. Um, I was in a, a housing estate the other night uh, where um, it's actually owned by not a housing association but another body. And uh, when I talked to the residents there again, hundreds of homes in that particular locality 
uh, that are owned by a particular group. And again, no fines, very cold, difficult to heat. We, we are really making a focus on this because I think what struck me was I went to the housing side of, as a local constituency representative about one estate and found that over 10 years they had been surveying those houses and that issue had never been identified. It just seems incredible that was allowed to happen. And that's why the, the uh, more dynamic and uh, innovative approach that we've now uh, brought into the housing executive, uh, that's one of the real positives in the current situation with the housing executive. I often am critical of the housing executive and I think legitimately so, but on that occasion and this issue, now we see action being taken at long last. Pity it took so long. And that is the end of questions.